I think we have a full house, so we're good to go. Great. So let me just uh, get the gallery. Hello, students, everybody. If you could turn on your cameras, that's good. So we can uh, see all of you. I hope everybody is well, enjoying the blizzard uh, in, in the neighborhood, I assume, uh, in New York, although I'm not sure. But uh, I'm uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, uh, one of the uh, co-professors of this class. Uh, and uh, uh, Anthony Annette, uh, Professor Annette, uh, will be the second uh, uh, of the faculty for the course. We're really excited uh, to be delving into a fascinating set of issues together with you. Uh, and we have a very uh, rich and full semester ahead. Um, we don't have a textbook because we're using this course to help write a textbook. So uh, you are, uh, you are uh, the first recipients of the first lectures and your feedback will be very helpful, uh, but it means uh, we'll be improvising along the way. And I think uh, in the class, you'll see many reasons uh, why we're improvising mainly because uh, the way that economics is taught right now uh, is just not good enough uh, for what we need in this world. We need an economics that can solve problems uh, and that understands what are the important problems. And uh, I think that that is not exactly the economics uh, in the mainstream textbooks right now. Um, that's why our course is called Modern Economics for a Sustainable and Inclusive Planet. So this is a, a teleological process. So we have a goal here uh, and we believe economics should have a goal also, uh, a goal to create a good society. And we should be thinking of economics as a set of tools with a purpose. Uh, and the purpose uh, we summarize in the title, uh, in this case, sustainability, meaning mostly environmental uh, sustainability and inclusion, meaning social justice and uh, prosperity and well being that is widely shared. Uh, and the ideas in this class uh, will be about what economics teaches us about uh, how to achieve sustainable and in inclusive societies. Uh, so uh, this is a little bit different from uh, normal economics in that in two ways. One is that mainstream economics, uh, as we'll be emphasizing, believes that a market system pretty much automatically does good things. Uh, and while there are failures of how the market economic system works, by and large, it's a pretty, pretty good system and uh, it uh, accomplishes most of what we want. And a famous uh, phrase was introduced about the market system about two and a half centuries ago, used by Adam Smith, one of the founders of economics, modern economics uh, called and the phrase is the invisible hand that market forces as if by an invisible hand uh, lead to good outcomes in society. And the other part of mainstream economics is not defining very clearly what is a good society? What is it that we would want our economies to uh, accomplish on behalf of the uh, humanity on behalf of the people living in them, both current generation and future generations. Uh, so that's often taken for granted. And then uh, we study in economics how markets work. Uh, and in our way of thinking about things, uh, we need clear objectives and we need a much clearer understanding that uh, markets buying and selling and private property, a capitalist economic system has some merits, but it also a lot of demerits as well. And when we think about designing institutions for 
achieving economic objectives, we're going to be looking for a much richer set of institutions than just the private free market. And this course will, I hope, help to uh, illuminate uh, that picture. In order to do so, we're going to be talking about a lot of uh, big thinkers uh, throughout history. Uh, you'll come to know very well that one of my favorites is Aristotle. Uh, we're we're going to be hearing a lot from Aristotle. Uh, we're going to be hearing a lot from uh, philosophers uh, over the 2,300 years between Plato and Aristotle and us today. Uh, actually, ideas about a good economy have changed several times in the course of uh, 2,300 years. I would wager that we're at a historic moment of another change because the ideas about the economic system that were propelled by Adam Smith when he wrote The Wealth of Nations in 1776, which contributed a lot of insights, I think have uh, in a way uh, run their course now and were very ripe for rethinking. That's the hypothesis of our course, uh, that in a period of environmental uh, crisis and a period of massive inequalities of income and wealth and in a an age of rapid technological change and the digital society we need to think again about what our our purposes what our our options in economics what is ethically the right approach uh, we'll talk a lot about ethics, uh, what it means actually, uh, and uh, what economic ethics entail. But in a nutshell, ethics, in my view, is the science of how to uh, achieve uh, good lives. Uh, and so we want economies that achieve good lives for the people uh, living today and in the future. And that's really what we're, what we're about. I'll be lecturing on Tuesdays. Uh, Professor Annette will be lecturing on Fridays. Uh, we will uh, have uh, uh, great support from uh, Jesse Thorson, if you could wave Jesse, who uh, uh, works with me uh, at uh, Columbia University. Um, I don't know if Meredith, uh, I don't think is on uh, right now, uh, but Meredith will be here on Fridays. Great. So Meredith will come on Friday. Uh, so uh, you'll have uh, two section uh, leaders to help uh, and, um, you know, help on uh, assignments, readings, and so forth. And uh, maybe I'll say a few words about what our agenda is. Everybody, I think, has received the reading list. Is that correct? Uh, so just to uh, go through it, we have a semester together. Uh, we'll have classes Tuesdays and Fridays. Uh, each week is a particular theme, of course. Uh, this week is what is economics. Uh, could you show me your hand if you've had an economics class before? So has everybody uh, studied economics in some level before? Is there anyone that has not? Goody, good. All right. That will uh, help us uh, definitely to deepen uh, our discussions, and I'm delighted to know that. So today I'm going to talk, uh, and uh, Friday, uh, Professor Annette will speak about what is economics. Uh, economics, as you know, is a lot about uh, choice. Uh, that's true, uh, I think, as a basic notion of uh, both the economic life and ethics is about making choices. So next week, we'll talk about what kinds of choices uh, we make, what are assumed about those choices, what are the critical choices uh, in uh, personal behavior uh, that we study in economics. So budget allocation, work versus leisure, intertemporal choices of saving uh, versus consumption today, uh, and so forth. Uh, 
The third week, we'll talk about uh, private property. This is an ancient theme. Uh, philosophers and theologians have been talking about private property for more than 2,000 years. Uh, in theology, uh, in many religions, uh, and in Christianity uh, in particular, a basic idea is uh, God created the world for everybody. Uh, and then uh, philosophers and theologians have pondered the question, well, if uh, God created the world for everybody, why does Jeffrey Bezos have $200 billion of it and the rest of us don't have anything? Hey, where are we? Aren't we part of everything? Uh, and so the question of how private property uh, fits into a world created for everybody has been a basic puzzle. Uh, and we live in our age, whether we know it or not, according to the philosophy of John Locke, who uh, wrote a, a theory about private property in, seven, in 1690 uh, in his second treatise on government, which we'll read, uh, which said uh, private property is consistent with uh, uh, a world created for everybody for the following reasons. And he put forward uh, his philosophical reasons. They're pretty interesting reasons. I think pretty strange ones also, we'll see. Uh, but one of uh, his motivations was to say, God created the world for everybody, but on my theory, we can take it away from the Native Americans uh, because they're not improving the land enough. Uh, and so uh, part of uh, this philosophy is uh, they're wasting the land. We, uh, the English settlers, uh, are so much uh, better at improving the land. So it's justice that the private, that the property belonged to us, not to the Native Americans. It's an example of uh, this conundrum about where do these property rights come from? How seriously should we take them? Are they consistent with social justice? Are they consistent with inclusion? Are they mere reflection of power, bias, uh, racism, or a hundred other possible considerations? So we'll talk about various theories of property and social justice in week three. In week four, we'll talk about not individual choices, whether to save or consume or what to spend your money on, but social choices. Uh, what should we do together, mainly through government, although government is not the only way we make collective decisions, but uh, social choice is a huge part of economics uh, because there are many things that are only uh, can only be accomplished if society as a whole does them. Uh, and uh, that requires a, a capacity to cooperate, which we think is probably pretty deeply hardwired psychologically, because we're a species that evolved for cooperation. But it requires what uh, economists and psychologists call pro-sociality, which means making decisions for the social uh, good rather than just individual good. There are many social dilemmas where what's good for you as an individual is not good for society, or what's good for society requires a sacrifice from you. Wearing a face mask is an example of pro-sociality. You wear a face mask, so <coughs> you have not just infected your, <laughs> your uh, counterpart that you're talking to. Well, this challenge of pro-sociality has been a big challenge for about half of America uh, this year, so something's not right in our social order that wearing a face mask became a big political issue. They're reading too much John Locke, I'm afraid, uh, not enough gospels. Uh, but in any event, uh, the point is that pro-sociality is a big issue if we're gonna get along in society and accomplish things together. And that requires a, a, a psychological attitude and a philosophical attitude. And we'll talk about that in week four. In week five, we'll continue about our role as citizens, because in economics, it's typical to study our role as consumers 
producers, workers, but in economics, you generally don't study our role as citizens. This is pretty strange. Most economics professors will say, well, if you want to study your role as citizens, go take a political science class. But so much of an economy depends on what government does. Governments tax 30 or 40 or 50 percent of the output of an economy and then use that to distribute uh, those goods in one way or another or to make public investments or to build roads or to hire policemen or to hire school teachers. So how could we talk about an economy when we don't talk about citizens? And Aristotle figured that out 2,300 years ago because uh, his book on politics starts out with economics and he understands that our role as citizens, in his case, in the Greek city-state, the polis, was critical for well-being. In week six, we'll talk about market theory. That's generally where most economics classes start, uh, but we'll talk about supply and demand and uh, what is known about markets. Markets are important. They are a positive part of achieving a good life, but they can be taken to excess because if you just rely on markets, uh, we end up with a destroyed world and a inequality that is so high that it would be ghastly uh, to live in such a society. And we need to understand why markets do good things, but why they also do bad things. We continue in week seven on that question. Why do markets often fail to promote the common interest? Uh, why do markets that are supposed to uh, serve consumers and produce value end up destroying value so easily? Uh, and that's the topic of week seven. In week eight, we'll talk about inequality, which has reached proportions that are absolutely stunning right now. We never had up until this year, someone with an income of $200 billion. Now we have two people, uh, Mr. Bezos and Mr. Musk with $200 billion of personal wealth. And uh, I'm gonna argue the, um, controversial point that you don't really need more than a billion dollars in your bank account uh, to do well. Uh, and so having 200 billion is probably a little bit too much, given that uh, half the world has nothing and uh, 1 billion people don't have enough to eat today. Uh, so something's not quite right with the economic system uh, if it produces those outcomes. So we'll talk about sources of inequality and distribution of income. In week nine, we'll talk about jobs. Very interesting topic uh, because the world of work is changing a lot. Of course, it's changed a lot throughout human history. Uh, a worker going to work in the year 35,000 BC got up in the morning and walked during the day hunting and gathering. And everybody was employed as hunters and gatherers, basically, uh, in small uh, bands of foragers. Uh, then around 10,000 years ago, there was a big disruption in the labor market, if you will. Uh, people uh, became farmers uh, and uh, with all the pluses and minuses that that entailed. But uh, 5,000 years ago, 95% of humanity farmed to stay alive, growing food for themselves and their families with maybe, maybe a little bit of surplus in a good year uh, that could be taxed by the priests or by the rulers or by the kings uh, and so forth. Actually, for most of human history, 80 to 90% of humanity farmed. Uh, that was true as recently as when Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations. And very few societies had a surplus of food that could support an urban, non-agricultural society, more than a few percent of the population. Then around 1776 or around 1800, the Industrial Revolution took off, and that changed our lives tremendously uh, because people uh, shifted from rural agricultural work to urban industrial employment. And uh, it was only 
around 2010, only around 10 years ago, that the world became more urban than rural. I don't know about you guys. I was born in a city, grew up in a city, lived in a city all my life. I've never lived on a farm. Uh, so for me, city life is, that's what I know. Uh, but for most of humanity, that is historically unprecedented uh, in uh, experience. And it's only in this current decade that we have more than 50% urban population. It's now estimated by the United Nations to be about 55% of the world living in urban areas. But it's changing very fast. And it will be 70 or 80% in urban areas by 2050. In the United States, the proportion of people who are farmers is down to 1% of the workforce. Now we're in a new change though, another revolution because of artificial intelligence, robotics uh, and uh, information technology, the digital world, which means that jobs are going to change tremendously again. Uh, in 20 years, rather than me lecturing to you, my computer will be lecturing to your computer. Uh, will probably, uh, you know, uh, it, it will be completely different uh, how we teach and learn. Jobs will be very different. Uh, and I believe uh, a lot of the issue will uh, of change will be uh, how do we create a world of decent work, uh, but also more non-work value to our lives, leisure time, uh, study, volunteer, care economy, and so on. So that's week nine is the changing world of work. Week 10 is a really perverse topic, poverty. Uh, uh, it's been an ancient topic. Uh, remember, uh, in fact, it's been probably the essence of economics up until this century, uh, most people were poor most of the time in human history. Most people lived at the edge of subsistence and uh, uh, poverty was seen to be everywhere. Uh, though it's a, out of context, Jesus said, uh, you will always have the poor with you. You won't always have me, but you'll always have the poor with you. Uh, and the idea was not shocking that there would always be poverty. But now we're living in a world where there doesn't have to be poverty anymore. Uh, and that raises some very powerful practical and philosophical and ethical issues. Why are there poor people in a world with so much wealth? Is that fair? Some people say yes, why not? Uh, we need to understand where does the poverty come from? Some philosophers and some practical politicians have said, look, the poor are poor because they're lazy. They're not talented. It's not my problem. Uh, if you're poor, tough luck, get a job, go to work, do something, but don't bother me about it. Uh, and we have that philosophy in the United States. There are others, uh, I, including myself, who say people are poor because of their life circumstances, their bad luck, uh, their uh, forces of uh, discrimination, social context. And that means that this is an urgent moral question as well as an urgent practical question. So that's what we'll talk about in week 11. Week 12, we'll talk about measuring well-being, because after all, if economics is about well-being, <laughs> how do you know? Adam Smith, who I've mentioned as really the founder of modern economics in the book, The Wealth of Nations, presumed that the way to well-being is wealth. And there's a certain point to it. If you don't have money, you're going to suffer terribly. And so it's pretty clear that having more wealth up to a point at least really does make you a lot better off. 
poverty is really tough. But it's also clear that wealth is not the same as well-being. And there have been huge advances in the last 40 years because of psychological work, sociological research, economics research, to actually measuring well-being more systematically. And we'll talk about that because that is very practical. Uh, if you want to be a good doctor, you better know what health is. And if you want to be a good economist, you better know what well-being is. Otherwise, we don't know what we're doing. Uh, just producing wealth is uh, going to be uh, very problematic. In week 12, we'll talk a bit about economic history over the long term. Uh, I've already hinted at this, that we've gone through a long evolution of economic life from hunter-gatherers to urban uh, service providers to some uh, new future this century where robots and artificial intelligence are going to do a lot of the work. Uh, and how do we describe that long history of economics and what explains those changes over time? And then the final week or final two weeks uh, in week 13, we'll be talking about short-term macroeconomics. We had last year a decline of economic output in the economy, 3.5% according to the measurement that was released a few days ago in the gross domestic product. What does that mean? Why did it happen? Well, in this case, pretty clear it happened with uh, because of COVID. Um, but there's a debate about how it happened. And that debate is very uh, present right now these days in debating President Biden's proposal for a $1.9 trillion stimulus package. Because People have very different ideas actually about what that package is for. But one idea is it's to stimulate the economy in the short term. What does that mean? That is the field of short term macroeconomics. Uh, you may have studied Keynesian economics uh, in your, yeah, I'm sure you did in economics class. Does that apply? I don't think so, by the way, uh, so much to this particular question. The economy didn't. Uh, shrink last year because of lack of aggregate demand, it declined because you couldn't go to a restaurant. You had the demand to, at least I did, uh, but it was closed. And uh, so were the movies, so was the sports events, so were the theaters, so were the hotels. And so in this sense, the economy declined because one part of the economy was lopped off and said, you can't go there. That's a very particular kind of economic shock. You're living with something the world has not experienced for 100 years uh, since the uh, flu epidemic uh, in 1919. So that's a different kind of macroeconomics. And we'll talk about those issues in week 13. And then week 14, we'll bring all the pieces together. Uh, and the term that I like to use is sustainable development. It's not original with me. Uh, it's a term that was introduced in 1987 by Dr. Gru Brundtland, who was prime minister of Norway. And she was chairing a global commission that introduced the term sustainable development. It's now the term used by the United Nations. I say it about 50 times a day. Uh, because that's my job. Uh, what does it mean? It means basically what we said, uh, a sustainable and inclusive planet. So you could put that under the rubric of sustainable development. We could have called this course Modern Economics for Sustainable Development. It would be almost the same idea. And we'll end the course <laughs> by discussing how uh, one could uh, think about a whole world, 193 countries, 7.8 billion people, some in rich countries, some in poor countries, and so on. How could a whole world adopt a new economic strategy? In the past, we thought economics kind of just happened. 
But now we're trying to design economics on a large scale. So we have lots of global meetings which say, you need to change the way your energy system works. You need to change the way your agriculture system works. So we're trying to change a whole part of the world economy consciously, peacefully, through negotiation and public policy. And that is, I want you to be empowered to have good ideas about that. And by the 14th week, you guys are in charge, yeah? Uh, that's the idea that we're trying to uh, give you tools for reshaping how businesses, government, individuals, should operate to make economies productive, inclusive, and sustainable. Those are the three big areas. Uh, or you could say prosperous, inclusive, and sustainable. Those are the three bottom lines of sustainable development. So that's the idea of this course. And uh, let me pause for any comments or questions. Uh, Please, uh, I don't know where, I think, wait a minute, under reactions. Yeah, you can raise your hand under the reactions button, as you know. Uh, so uh, feel free to do that during lectures also to raise your hand. You may not be called on, but uh, maybe you will. Um, but in any event, I want, we're a small enough group that we should get to know each other and have, uh, have a discussion along the way. So before I turn to lecture number one, uh, any thoughts or questions? Well, most of these readings um, for the weeks we posted on- now, Can you speak uh, louder, Eva? Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, now I can. On Blackboard or should we, um, do we have to- Still can't hear you, sorry. sorry. Oh, wait a minute, I'm turning mine okay. up. Um, well, most uh, of these, <laughs> can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, will most of these readings be posted on Blackboard or should we order any course material? Uh, <laughs> give us a couple of days to figure out everything, uh, but most of it will be posted uh, and uh, we'll let you know uh, what else needs to be ordered. But for the moment, you don't have to order anything. Uh, almost everything will be posted. And as I say, at least on my part, because uh, I'm a kind of uh, um, uh, last minute uh, delivery, uh, real time delivery, uh, there, there will be new readings suggested along the way. So we'll try to give as much advance notice as possible, but I'm sure we'll be posting, oh, this is interesting, this is good because there is no textbook, unfortunately, uh, it, it will be improv. Okay, sounds good, thank you. Okay, let me share my screen and By the way, this is not the start of my lecture, but it is a piece of my favorite picture in the world, uh, the School of Athens by Raphael in the Vatican. Uh, and uh, it's a picture of Plato on the left and Aristotle on the right. Uh, they're each uh, holding uh, books that they've written. Uh, I like pictures of authors. Uh, so uh, Plato is holding uh, the uh, dialogue uh, Timaeus uh, which is about the creation, and uh, Aristotle is holding uh, the Nicomachean Ethics, uh, which is uh, maybe my favorite book. Uh, and uh, they're going to be guides for us uh, throughout uh, a lot of uh, a lot of the the course. So I'm going to leave a PowerPoint for you to look at because I will not be able to get through most of this today, given that uh, I've used. Uh, much of the hour to set the stage. But this is an overview of where we're going. And uh, just to say a few quick things. Uh, when we think of the economy, uh, we will be discussing 
the range of activities that constitute economic life. Those include natural resources uh, and uh, the, the nature-based parts of the economy, agriculture and mining, uh, the transformation parts of an economy, construction and manufacturing, and the services part of the economy, which is trade like shops, transport, delivery of goods, finance, health, education, leisure, uh, personal services, and government. So an economy has the three main sectors, the nature-based sectors, the transformation-based sectors, and the service-based sectors. And we use goods also in a variety of ways. We consume them, use them up, like when we eat our food. Uh, we uh, invest for the future, building houses, uh, roads, power grids, factories, software, all different kinds of investment. We sell some of our goods abroad. We import some of our goods. We'll talk about all of the uh, budget constraints that track how these different parts of economic life interrelate. One of the biggest issues that we'll face everywhere is that we need to, we need to live. Uh, to live, we need to eat. We need to have safe water. We need to have access to shelter, to clothing, to our basic economic needs. How do we get access to those goods and services? It's a fundamental question of economics. One way is it, throughout most of history, we produce the things we need directly. Households producing their own food and uh, making their own clothes and uh, building their own shelters. So direct household production was the major way an economy worked for thousands of years. Uh, now we gain access to goods and services mainly through earning money by wages and salaries, and then buying things that we need in the marketplace. Or if we're wealthy, if we have financial assets, we also have the income from the shares of stock we own, from the interest on our bank balances, from the rent that we may earn if we're uh, renting a building as a landlord or renting land to a farmer. So we have financial income. But another way we gain access to goods and services that governments directly provide them. When you get your COVID vaccine, I assume it's going to be for free for you at point of service because the government will uh, pay for that generally. SNAP, which I show here is uh, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, poor people getting uh, dollar credits on a, a bank card, a debit card, to buy food, or we get our enjoyment by walking in Central Park or in public areas provided by government. We also could gain access through uh, what our parents give us uh, or what our children give us, intrafamilial transfers, or we could gain access to goods and services through gifts, charity, and other voluntary activities. Usually in an economics class, the focus is put on what you earn and what you spend. I just wanted to include this to say there are many ways to meet economic needs, even in a market economy. And in truth, in most uh, rich parts of the world, Europe, Canada, a large part of what is uh, accessed by households doesn't come from the income of the households, but comes from the automatic provision of those services by the government. In the United States, much less so. In the United States, you basically eat what you earn to a significant extent, or if you're in an affluent family, what your family gives you. But if you are in a poor family and unemployed, good luck to you. Uh, you'll get some uh, help, but you probably won't get all that much help. And uh, 
we are therefore more a market system than other places. What's important for us to discuss is how should people uh, gain access to basic needs? Should there be a universal basic income? Should certain things be guaranteed by the government? Should people uh, sink or swim, depending on uh, what they earn in the labor market? Of course, that's a big debate, uh, and we'll discuss those issues. Economics is largely about choices. We're going to study choices next week. What do you produce? Uh, how do you use nature? Uh, <clears throat> how do you use your uh, buying power uh, from your earnings? How much should you spend on rent? How much should, should you buy for furniture, for clothing, for other things? Should you save for the future or borrow against the future income? What should you study uh, if you are thinking about future careers? Uh, what kind of jobs should you seek? Uh, how should you use your time? Studying, working, volunteering, in retirement, on vacation? Time allocation is part of economic choice. As a citizen, should you vote for or against uh, a referendum on taxes? or for candidates who support more taxes or less taxes. If you're a government official, uh, how should you interfere, intervene in market transactions? Should anything go? Should you regulate certain transactions? Should you say to business, no, you can't do that? Should we say to Facebook, that's not allowed? Or to the mining company, that's not allowed? Or as President Biden did last week, to TransCanada, which wants to build a pipeline in the United States. No, we're not going to allow that because we don't want more oil production. We want more renewable energy production. So these are choices. Ah, what's the goal of an economy? Uh, that's a, a big question. For Adam Smith, it was pretty clear. The goal is wealth. Not a bad choice when everybody's poor to say wealth will raise our well being. But just going for wealth is a little bit uh, dangerous. Uh, wealth for whom? Wealth for everybody? Wealth for Mr. Bezos and, and Mr. Monk and Mr. Gates? Uh, wealth, even if it means environmental harm? wealth even if there are extremely poor people for some people libertarians the goal is liberty just don't tell me what to do period uh don't tell me to wear a face mask don't tell me what to buy don't tell me to buy uh, an electric car i'll drive what i want and freedom or liberty is defined as the goal for some, the idea is it's for happiness. I'm of that view. So was Aristotle and Plato. They used a term for happiness, eudaimonia, which uh, you may have heard about before. Uh, it means good spirits in ancient Greek, uh, but it basically means a thriving life. But for whom? Uh, one problem for uh, Aristotle, though I regard him as a, a great teacher, is he said happiness for the free citizens of Athens, but slaves, not so much. In fact, not necessarily at all. Uh, so when you talk about promoting happiness, whose happiness is important? For some, the goal is equality. Whatever you do, we should be equal. That was uh, a uh, a dream of uh, Soviet socialism. It didn't work out very well for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons was that there came to be a very serious trade-off between equality and freedom and equality and wealth, uh, because enforcing equality meant a rigid 
society. Uh, and so equality is a goal, but in which way, to what extent? Uh, for some, uh, an economy should be about glory, more pyramids built. Uh, this was Nietzsche's view uh, that uh, the best of society is glory. Uh, and uh, it, it leaves a lot of people behind. It can mean gory as well as glory uh, because it can glorify war uh, or conquest, but it's a view that's been taken. Uh, Pope Francis uh, said in Laudato Si that our goal should be to protect nature or in theological terms to protect creation. So that is uh, definitely part of the objective of sustainable development. But this, this debate, what is an economy? Is it something that we choose the objectives? How do you choose the objectives? On what ethical basis? What are the trade-offs involved is essential for economic analysis. Uh, Plato and Aristotle introduced core ideas of Western ethics and of economics, but I think one of the most important contributions is that they introduced the core idea that a society should aim for what Aristotle calls the summum bonum, the highest good. And the highest good, he said, was eudaimonia, or well-being or thriving, uh, depending on the translation. And so we want to understand what is uh, well-being and how it can be achieved. So here are some summaries of Ar Aristotelian thought that we'll discuss in the course. There, there's the word I'm referring to, eudaimonia, the summum bonum, the telos, meaning the purpose, the end point, the realization of potential is well-being. Aristotle thought that you achieve well-being by cultivating reason, think, <laughs> thinking in our heads, thinking clearly. Uh, and the excellence of reason, we translate the word excellence as virtue. The highest virtue of clear reason in ancient Greek was phronesis practical wisdom to make good choices. Uh, and uh, one other idea, very key that we'll talk about, is uh, Aristotle's idea that humanity is a zoan politikon, a social animal, that we inherently, we don't need a social contract, we grow up in society, there's no way to live outside of society. So it's not that there's a a contract between individuals like Hobbes thought or Locke, we are social animals to the core. And that gives a particular idea about aiming for the social interest. Of course, uh, Western thought is to a very large extent Christian thought and uh, Christ's teachings, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, are about mercy and social justice. Uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, says uh, Jesus, and uh, teaches that uh, the responsibility uh, of his followers is to feed and clothe the poor in Matthew 25. This is an economic concept that is absolutely a core idea of much of Western philosophy. We dismissed it uh, recently in the last couple of hundred years because libertarians don't talk about the responsibility to feed the poor. They talk about feed yourself. But uh, the idea in <clears throat> philosophical terms that everybody as part of having human dignity should have guaranteed access to economic goods like enough food to eat is actually enshrined not only in religious teachings like the Sermon on the Mount, 
but is enshrined also in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, something that we'll talk about later in the course. That is a moral charter of the members of the United Nations, all of them, which says in the Universal Declaration that everybody has a right to a standard of living sufficient for human dignity, meaning enough to eat, for shelter, for health, and for education. It's right there in 1948, uh, agreed, but it's obviously not true in the world today. So I think there is philosophically a direct line from Aristotle and Plato to Jesus's teachings and the Gospels to great philosophers like Thomas Aquinas in the Middle Ages, who combined Aristotelian and, uh, and uh, Christian thought into a grand philosophy in the Summa Theologica that helps us even in practical terms today on this economics question, how do you gain access to basic needs? And in uh, the philosophical ideas we'll discuss, uh, one of them is that everybody has an entitlement to meet basic needs. And that means if they have that right, somebody else has the responsibility like Mr. Bezos, Mr. Gates, uh, and uh, a lot of the rest of society to ensure that the counterpart of their wealth is not extreme poverty. And obviously we have not fulfilled that idea on a global scale. So uh, we will talk about Christian social teachings in this economic context because they are not only of tremendous insight and value, they are the core of a lot of Western philosophy uh, in, uh, the, uh, in Europe and in the Americas, uh, and then worldwide, uh, that plays a very large role in our thinking. There's a different uh, set of ideas that is much more individualistic and that is a very fascinating story of uh, philosophical history and a complex one, not a simple one, but uh, the idea of the rise of the individual is an important part of the rise of the idea of the free market. And uh, we'll have time to talk about ideas of Machiavelli, of Martin Luther and the Reformation which it was a much more individualistic approach to Christianity, uh, of Calvin and the idea of the individual calling, and therefore a much more burden on individuals. If you're poor, it's because you are not, uh, you, you are not uh, fulfilling your responsibility, your calling. So a lot of philosophy from Machiavelli's time, he wrote uh, in uh, the early 1500s. Martin Luther, of course, uh, uh, started the, uh, his uh, Protestant uh, 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 Reformation with the 95 Theses in 1517. And Calvin, one generation later, is part of a shift of philosophy towards a much more individual and free market philosophy. And uh, others that contributed to this thinking are Thomas Hobbes, who you may have studied, uh, who uh, talked about, basically invented the idea of the social contract by saying that uh, without a social contract, life is solitary, brutish, uh, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And people get together in society and in the case of Hobbes, under the guise of a Leviathan, a powerful absolutist ruler to live. But Hobbes's idea was we're a society of individuals and we are not sociable. Uh, we are not zoon politikon as 
Aristotle said. In fact, Hobbes attacks Aristotle very heavily for that. And he propounds a much more individualistic philosophy. And that brings us to uh, the 18th century and to Adam Smith, who was a great thinker, wrote The Wealth of Nations in 1776. But The Wealth of Nations is a uh, both a philosophy and an explication of a market economy. And it has the idea of the invisible hand as being the way that market forces lead to the social good. Well, we'll be talking a lot about that and qualifying that idea in our discussions. Modern economics is in flux, uh, but when I studied economics uh, 40 years ago, it was called neoclassical economics because the classical economists were Adam Smith, uh, David Ricardo, John Stuart Mill. They were followed by neoclassical economics. There still is neoclassical economics, but economics itself is in flux. One part of neoclassical economics, which I've mentioned is libertarian economics which says the real goal of society is leave me alone. Don't take away my liberty. That's a philosophical position. Uh, Professor Annette and I think it's a disastrous philosophical position. We'll explain why, but we can discuss and debate those ideas. Uh, we will look at alternatives, why modern economics is in philosophical flux by looking at this concept of sustainable development, prosperity, inclusion, sustainability, and the good governance to bring it along, including the 17 sustainable development goals. And I will leave you with a chart to look at. Uh, it's a little bit of a caricature, but it compares and we'll deepen our understanding of this throughout the, the 14 weeks. Mainstream economics as it exists in the textbooks today and the economics for sustainable development. Uh, and uh, arguing that there are real differences philosophically and practically. And uh, mainstream economics is much more supportive of a free market economy it's much more libertarian. It's much more oriented towards private property rights. It's much more individualistic. And economics for sustainable development is much more social. It's much less, uh, doc, I would say it's much less committed to liberty than it is to mercy and justice. Liberty is a goal, but not the only goal. It believes much more in pro-sociality and the common good. And it is uh, much more directed towards the environmental crises of our time. And so this is the beginnings of the comparison that we'll make. Uh, maybe I'll end here with uh, a famous paradox uh, called the Easterlin Paradox, named after Professor Richard Easterlin at University of Pennsylvania. He used one measure of happiness shown in the red line, in this case from 1972 to 2016, and one measure of wealth, which is GDP per capita. And if you see, uh, wealth has gone up a lot between 1972 and 2016, uh, actually more than doubling in per capita income. But well being, mm, not so much in the United States. It's gone down compared to what people reported in the 1970s and 80s. So, big increase of wealth, not such a big increase of well being. That is our puzzle and really our goal in a way. So we've reached the end of the hour. That's where we're uh, headed. Uh, Professor Annette will pick up uh, actually, um, or 
he's going to pick up right now. I have to run each uh, Monday, each Tuesday at the top of the hour because of my schedule. Uh, but I think there are 15 minutes more in the class. And uh, Tony, you're going to go over uh, the course, the requirements, the assignments, and where we're heading. Yes? Yes. Very good. All right. Thanks to all of you. Uh, thanks for a good attention, for getting us off to a good start. Uh, we're going to be writing up what we're doing uh, as we go along. So we'll get transcripts also and more readings uh, alongside uh, these notes. But you're going to help us write a good book. Plenty of feedback, chats, questions, comments, objections. Uh, that's your responsibility, yeah? And uh, thanks uh, for being in the course. I will see you a week from today. Uh, Professor Annette will continue now and he'll be lecturing on Friday. So thanks uh, to everybody and see you in a week's time. Great, thank you, Jeff. Um, can everybody hear me? Okay, very good. So, um, as Je so as Jeff said, um, Professor Sachs, I will be teaching on Fridays and he will be teaching on Tuesdays. Um, I figured that we would just take the, um, the rest of the time just to go through, uh, Jeff already went through the course in terms of the material that we uh, will be, we'll be discussing. I'll talk about some of the housekeeping or the logistical parts of it. So, um, Grading and assignments. I know this is probably not not what you want to hear in class one, uh, but don't worry. There's nothing we, we we don't do weekly assessments or anything like that. Um, but um, there will be a midterm in class, a final in class, and then within the within the semester there will be two written assignments, uh, one longer one and one short one. Um, we will announce them. In, in plenty of, you'll see in the syllabus when they're due. I tried to space it out so there's an assessment every three or four weeks, so including the midterm and the final. So the first one will be due towards the end of February, uh, but we will um, we will uh, assign that. Uh, you you'll get enough time uh, to to know what it is. And our goal is to help you is to uh, in the assessments is to kind of help you think through in more detail through some of these philosophical concepts applied to very real world, uh, very contemporary uh, economic uh, concerns. Um, yeah, so that's, that, that, that is that. Um, everything, um, there was a question earlier, all of the readings hopefully will be put in Blackboard, except um, if there are copyright issues um, with some books that we asking you to read a number of chapters from, we have to respect copyright. But as, as, as Professor Sachs says, we'll figure that out down the road, uh, how we handle that. Um, now I have, um, you might have seen in the, in, the, in the syllabus, if you've looked at it, I am currently writing a book uh, that's called Cathonomics, How the Catholic Tradition Can Create a More Just Economy. Uh, it's going to be published by Georgetown University Press, so yay Jesuits, um, later on this year. And the editor has given me permission to use this text for this course. So you will see the, the, the chapters that I will be lecturing from are, will be posted to Blackboard as Word files. And uh, you already have um, for the first uh, three weeks of the course, you already have the uh, the, the relevant chapters from from that book. Um, of course, this book is still being written. So, if you have any feedback to me, if anything that doesn't make sense, let me know, and uh, we'll make sure that uh, in the next iteration of it. This is a work in progress, by the way. This is not the final version. Um, the 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 editor will come back with comments. So. You're seeing a lot. You're seeing a very first draft, so there will probably be typos in there. There will probably be things that will change between now and the end of the book. But um, we wanted you to have access to this book because a lot of the concepts that we will be talking about in this course 
especially the the tradition that starts the tradition that merges uh, the Christian social teachings, especially the Catholic social teachings and the tradition of uh, Aristotle. Um, they both come together in the kind of the synthesis of Thomas Aquinas and inform modern Catholic social teaching. And my basic argument in this book is that these ancient teachings have a lot of contemporary relevance. And that's why we're putting it there. The other thing you might have seen in the syllabus is that we're asking you to look at some videos in a MOOC, a massive open online course produced by the SDG Academy. The SDG Academy is under the banner of SDSN, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, um, as well as being a Gabelli Fellow at Fordham University. I'm also a senior advisor at SDSN. The director, of course, is Professor Jeffrey Sachs, who you've just met. Um, but he, he has an, they have an online academy which have some amazing courses. And just look at the courses. There's, there's lots of fascinating courses you just might be interested in in your spare time. Like there's a course on the, on the, on the science of climate change, for example, on, on all aspects of sustainable development. But for the point of view of this course, we have assigned a, um, a course called Ethics and Action. Uh, Ethics and Action was an initiative that I worked on with uh, Jesse, who's here, and uh, under the leadership of Jeffrey Sachs and Bishop Marcelo Sanchez Sorondo, who is the Chancellor of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences and Social Sciences at the Vatican. Um, uh, an academy that was that goes all the way back to uh, Galileo um, and we brought together thinkers and leaders from all the different religious traditions economists business people labor people development experts activists all kinds of different people to discuss how how do you think through the major modern economic and social challenges from an ethical perspective. Because as you probably have realized that this ethical perspective, which we will focus a lot on this course, is uh, very much missing from the discourse right now. If you read um, an article in the New York Times about I don't know, uh, you know, Biden's economics plan or whatever, you'll get a lot of technical details, you'll get a lot of pros and cons, but you will get very little kind of, well, what are the ethical frameworks that are underpinning this, this discussion, these arguments? So we're going to try and rectify that in this course. And to help you with that, um, we will assign some chapters from this MOOC. You just have to you watch the chapters, take notes, however you do it. You don't need to do any of the assignments in the course, because you're not taking that course, you're, you're taking this course, which you can see, and there are some great experts there. So as, as an example, when we talk about, uh, for example, there's a lecture on the, the, um, the Hebrew scriptures and poverty, which will be taught by a great uh, Rabbi David Rosen, who's a real expert, uh, Orthodox rabbi in Israel, a real, real, real brilliant mind. And there's a lot of brilliant minds in this course. There's also me, kind of a less than brilliant mind, but uh, you know, you, you take what you can get. Um, these course will be taught by Zoom. This will be the way it will be done every week, um, at least until we're comfortable enough with, with the rollout of vaccines to be able to do it as, in a more hybrid version. I would, there's nothing I would love more than to be able to go into a Fordham classroom and meet you all face to face. Um, I don't, this lecturing by Zoom is not ideal, but uh, it is what it is. We're in a difficult situation, so we make the best of it. So for now, we will be doing everything uh, on this way through Zoom. And Zoom best practices, as you know, keep your cameras on unless you have a concern with privacy. You know, we want to be respectful of everybody, but um, having cameras on it helps us to kind of uh, recreate a more uh, realistic classroom uh, environment. Um, but feel free to, you know, if you need to take a bio break in the middle of class, feel free to do it. Self-care is very important. 
We want everybody to feel relaxed and comfortable and to get the most out of this course. Uh, and we want to be flexible and informal in, in that thing. Uh, in terms of um, office hours, um, the feedback I've gotten from other people who've taught by a Zoom is that students often prepare, prefer to have office hours at the same time right after class to avoid having to log on to Zoom all day long. So what I will do is after class on Friday, after I finish lecturing, I will stay on the Zoom. I'll turn off the recording, uh, but I'll stay on the Zoom until noon. We can ask for any questions or discussion. If there are still people who want to ask questions after that, we can do something bilaterally. Just send me an email. Uh, I, I'm available uh, to all of you. This is a small class. As Jeff said, I want to get to know all of you. Uh, it's more difficult uh, when we're not in person, but I think we all should get to know each other nonetheless through our 14 or 15 weeks together. Um, and that is, uh, that is the office hours. Um, I guess um, it's funny. I've, I've been talking for um, 15 minutes uh, almost. The class is almost over. But uh, let me introduce, I've never actually introduced myself. So we're, we're taking things in reverse. I introduced myself at the end. Um, my name is Anthony Annette. I have a PhD in economics from Columbia University from 1998. Uh, for many years, I was a traditional economist at the International Monetary Fund. I was a speech writer for the managing director, that's Christine Lagarde, when she was at the IMF. Uh, I have left the IMF. I now work with uh, Professor Sachs on a number of different initiatives, and I am a, a Gabelli Fellow at, the, uh, at Fordham, a school, uh, Gabelli School of Business, where I am working with the leadership team on the reforming the Jesuit uh, curriculum development, of which this course is an integral part. As Professor Sachs says, we are writing a text. We don't have a textbook because we are writing one. You are the guinea pigs uh, for, this, for this course. So we would like you to help us write this textbook. So your feedback is, your fee, student feedback is always important. But I think for this course, your feedback is even more important than normal because we are writing this textbook. We want to know what works, what doesn't work, what do you want to hear more of, what do you want to hear less of, what would make a really compelling narrative for redesigning economics along a more ethical, uh, Catholic-infused um, approach uh, than we have now. Um, I see you've all taken some economics courses. Um, so in this course, we will not be spending too much time going over old ground. We will not be doing indifference curves and utility functions and things like that. We will be focused more, as Professor Sachs says, on uh, making rational choices through the Aristotelian framework, not the neoclassical framework. Um, there will be some overlap, though, especially towards the end of the course when we get to the more macroeconomic stuff. Um, there, there will be probably closer overlap with uh, the stuff you're familiar with, though we will try and keep it contemporary and relevant. We want this course to answer, to discuss the, 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 the compelling questions that you all face right now, which is things like uh, sustainability, inequality, the future of work, uh, climate change, uh, the stuff that we know that you're all interested in. It is 11.15. Um, by the way, as I lecture, uh, feel free to shoot any questions in the chat. Uh, I will try and keep an eye on that or put your hand up, uh, whatever works. I think we are a small enough group to make, to make this work and keep it uh, very informal. Um, so uh, it's 11.16, so I'm going to let you go uh, unless there are, are there any questions, logistical questions or any questions uh, about our next uh, 14 weeks together you would like to ask uh, right now otherwise i will see you on friday where i will pick up from where professor Sachs left off and we'll do a deeper dive into the aristotelian and uh, the catholic traditions um okay questions comments no 
All right. Well, thank you very much. By the way, these, uh, this Zoom is going to be recorded. Um, we're going to take, so as well as we have uh, Jesse Thorson from Jeff Sachs's office. Uh, let me also introduce your fellow classmate, Alexi Avgerinos, who is working with me on some of the technical stuff. And, you know, and he will be helping with uh, um, uh, making sure that uh, everybody has access to these recordings um, and, 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 and all the readings that, that, that are needed uh, through the course. As Professor Sachs says, this is a work in progress, so some readings will be added. Um, some of the readings use are, are more important than others. Some are really deep background readings that are interesting to read, but probably not 100% needed for the course. Um, we can discuss that in greater detail if you like, um, but uh, it's often good to, to have a deep dive into, into stuff like this. So for example, the readings this week, we have assigned some chapters from some, from some Aristotle and some Hobbes, mainly so you can see how Hobbes and Aristotle are so different from each other and how they're, they're different assumptions. And we have assigned, I think, um, a chapter from David Wooten's book who discusses the, the enlightenment turn towards the individual and the insatiable appetites. We'll talk more about that on Friday. And he, okay, I'm running over. I promise that we won't, I will not be running over in the future, but I guess... Uh, uh, you give me a liberty. You give me some allowance for the first class. Um, okay, you have my email. You know who I am. We're going to have a lot of fun. Uh, thank you so much, and I'll see you all on Friday. Okay, take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.